Good morning, everybody. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the monthly webinar for perinatal mental health. Um, just a quick reminder as people join of um, housekeeping. So if we can ask you to put your lines on mute and turn off your videos um, while speakers are presenting. Um, obviously, please switch them on to ask questions. Um, raise your hand for any questions and for feedback. And obviously, um, hopefully it will be lively in the chat function today. Um, we are recording the webinar as always so that people can watch at a later date if they're not able to attend today. So just to inform you of that. Thank you very much for joining us all today. Um, so normally, as you know, we have a theme for each webinar, um, but this month we are a pick and mix and we're probably going to be a pick and mix for October as well. Um, the reason being we have shuffled things around a little bit in order to um, work around availability of speakers. Um, so rather than having one set theme, we're going to have a pick and mix of themes today. So we will be having um, a bit of health inequalities, um, a focus on system wide working and the provider collaboratives, and then also um, our regular feature of Hello, My Name Is. So if I can have the next slide, which will have the agenda. So um, as usual, uh, Jenny and I will kick off with a bit of a national update and some of the resources and that available to you guys. Um, as we said, they will, we will then have a focus on health inequalities and we're lucky enough to be uh, joined by Naomi today, who's going to talk about the Sheffield Maternity Cooperative. Um, and we have commissioned some training from them. Um, so she will talk a little bit more about that as part of her presentation. We are then going to have a bit of a focus on system wide working, thinking about provider collaboratives. Um, and Becky Gill is going to um, give us an update on that. Um, and just hot off the press, um, we have a stakeholder engagement event that we will be holding for provider collaboratives uh, for perinatal mental health on Wednesday, the 10th of November. Um, I'll put details of that in the chat later. Um, invites haven't yet gone out, they will be going out shortly, but just really to hold that date in, in your diaries, it will be Wednesday the 10th of November, 10 till 12 um, event workshop. So further details will follow. And then after Becky, we have got Becky Inglis, um, who's going to do a feature, the Hello My Name Is, and talk about her specialist um, role as a perinatal mental health pharmacist. So, um, as always, a great packed agenda um, and hopefully it'll be really interactive within the um, chat as well. So next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to kick off with a couple of slides for national update. So if I can have the next slide, please. So um, I know we've started talking about this in various um, sort of smaller parts. Um, can I just ask people to put themselves on mute? There's a bit of feedback. And if people can switch their cameras off if they're not presenting. Thank you. Um, but just to highlight uh, the focus for the national team on investment. So obviously we know that there is a tall ask in terms of um, the access target for the last couple of years. So can I just ask people to put themselves on mute? a bit of feedback. Um, so obviously the access target is 8.6% for this year and 10% for next year. Um, what the national team are asking in terms of the planning round this year is that there is um, commitment by ICSs um, to invest 100% of the allocation for perinatal mental health in the next financial year of 2022-23. So we had a deep dive with the specialist teams last week and started talking about that and any support that you may need as part of the planning round um, taking place currently. Um, but just to say there is a real focus on investment. It will be discussed within the quarter two deep dives that are held um, nationally to the regional teams. Um, and so really, at this stage, it's about having those robust local plans in place um, on the assumption of 100% funding. 
and also a real push for recruitment so that um, posts can start from the 1st of April um, 2022. So um, if there is any support you require for that, please do get in touch with us um, as the regional team or also directly with the national team. Um, and we will be doing some further work on that. OK, next slide, please. And then just really in terms of um, recognising some of the barriers to delivery and some of the challenges beyond the investment. So we know that there's a real challenge in terms of workforce, um, both you know, finding the available workforce in terms of recruitment, but also in terms of training, education, supervision, et cetera. Um, I've got some slides in a minute in terms of um, some of the education and training that we've bid for recently that we will be putting on um, before the end of the financial year. But also in terms of um, our teams understanding the cohort in order to expand and see 10 percent of, of women to hit the access target. Um, so we will be doing some focused work both ourselves, but also um, the national team will be giving some further sort of guidance in terms of the expectation of what what is that cohort. Um, and then also an understanding that there have been challenges in terms of um, clinic spaces and that lost in terms of um, COVID and the changes of working. Also, um, that balance of face to face working and virtual. Um, there have been issues in terms of the quality of data and sometimes the issues of coding, and we've been working hard as a region to address that. And then also capturing those um, ethnic minority groups, making sure that they are represented within the women that we see, and also expanding the services um, to 24 months and increasing the psychological therapies. But So I think really my main point is just to, we don't underestimate the amount of work that needs to be done and is going on within perinatal mental health. Um, but obviously we are here as a regional team to support you with that and also the national team as well. Next slide, please. So this is just a reminder and this is um, focused for the maternal mental health services. Um, and we have a meeting for the programme managers tomorrow morning. Um, but currently there is the system development fund spending review quarter two and annual data collection out for return by October the 14th. Um, that is a system return at ICS level, but obviously um, the maternal mental health services will be filling that out themselves. Um, both the quarter return and also the annual tab has to be completed for this quarter, um, but we will go into more detail with those individuals that are involved in completing that at the meeting tomorrow. OK, next slide, please. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that we have um, been lucky enough to be able to bid for further training monies. Um, each year we we bid for training monies to upskill our workforce uh, with education and training. We have within the South East been successfully awarded a £65,500 uh, training budget. Um, at this stage and so these are some of the courses that we are putting on um, they will be advertised shortly um, and will take place before the end of the financial year um, and I think really again looking at the diversity of what we're offering in terms of um, health inequalities being a big um, agenda item for us this year um, and then some so kind of upskilling our pathway of workforce but also some more specialist niche training as well for the specialist teams okay next slide please and then also i just wanted to mention um two successful bids that were we heard about last week um so that came from a regional fund um from health education england southeast so um many of you will know about our perinatal pathway screening tool um, and Jules McCoy is uh, kind of going to do an evaluation of the tool. Um, and so we've had money in order to fund that. And we've also been successful in a bid to offer emotional well-being visits, um, listening visits, champions training, which will be delivered by the Institute of Health Visitors. Um, and that's to have 40 champions across the southeast. So further details of that training will be coming out shortly. OK, next slide, please. 
so we have um prior to chelsea flower show we had um talked about the success that um rosewood were going to have um that there was going to be a garden at chelsea flower show which would then go to rosewood mother and baby unit um and there's just the link takes you through to some of the footage um that was on chelsea flower show last week and it was also on the on the one show as well beautiful garden and so just wanted to have the opportunity to showcase that again and um, no doubt Rosewood are looking forward to having that um, for their mothers and babies to enjoy at the unit. Okay next slide please. I'm going to hand over to Jenny at this point and she's going to take over in terms of the resources that we wanted to highlight to you. Good morning everybody. Um, so my first resource for this month, um, which is fairly hot off the press, is the long awaited, um, which is now called CR232, which replaces CR197, which a lot of us have been very familiar with. And what I would say about this document, I think, Firstly, is a big reminder that this does sit outside of the long term plan. So please don't read it and think and then be going to commissioners saying we need another six psychiatrists because um, we are working within the ask of the long term plan currently. And so think of CR 232 as an aspirational document for the for the next steps, I would say. What I would say about it is that it's got some really good um, information in there about all of our stakeholders and um, wherever you're working, be that third sector, parent, infant, maternity, health visiting, IAT, there's literally something for everybody in there about what those services should look like. So it's a really good read for not just specialist services, but all of our stakeholders. OK, next one, please. Um, so Liz has mentioned that we've been successful with some funding. We're still in the process of setting up our steering group. And thank you to all the people that have come forward to say they want to be part of the steering group about training and education. We do now have a, a date for the first meeting. Um, we also would like um, to do a final shout out to see if there's anybody else that's interested in joining. And at the moment, we don't have any representation on there from IAPT. So I do a, a special ask to our colleagues working in IAPT that it would be really lovely to have you represented on that meeting. Next slide, please. The Living Library I wanted to talk to you about. So this is a new um, initiative. Now that we're into business case season and knowing the struggles that Liz has already spoken about this morning and struggles that you'll all be familiar with about recruiting to certain posts, we thought it would be helpful to create what we've called a living library. So these are practitioners who are working in some of the more sort of unusual posts within perinatal. Um, and these people have all given permission for their contact details to be shared or for you to come via our generic email address. So that if you were interested in, for example, I'll take Becky, who's the top of the list and who's actually presenting for us today. So Becky is, um, is a pharmacist working in perinatal. If you were interested in having that role in your service, you could get in touch with Becky, find out a bit more about it, maybe get a job description. And hopefully this is a way to sort of oil the wheels for um, helping you to think about how can we fill some of these gaps in our workforce? What else could we use to, so to help people to think maybe a little bit more imaginatively, a little bit more outside of the box? but also have the support of being able to talk directly to the people in those roles to find out if it is the right sort of match for you. So um, I won't really labour over it, but we've got the carers, piss port workers, and you can sort of see the list down the side. And we've got the nurse educator, because I know that was a role that quite a few of you were interested in. And 
hopefully this resource list will grow over time. So again, anybody on the call who thinks actually my role is a bit different, people might want to hear about that. Please do get in touch and we'll add you to the Living Library. OK, next slide, please. This is just a reminder um, that it's World Mental Health Day coming up. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are doing anything particular to market, but do let us know if you are. Um, and there will be um, a film coming out to market, so we'll be looking out for that. Next slide, please. Um, I know that a lot of you will have already been signed up to 1001 days, but they are having um, a sort of new campaign called Turn Off the Taps. And what that alludes to is that um, at the moment, in terms of babies and the 0-24 to months agenda, what we're doing currently is mopping the floor so we are dealing with the problems, but what the Turn Off the Taps campaign is saying, let's start earlier and let's turn off the taps to prevent these problems developing. So there's a lot of good stuff. If you haven't seen it, do um, use some of the links when the slides come out. Um, there's a free webinar on the 1st of October. Um, so lots of stuff going on with that one that I think would be really relevant to this pathway of perinatal and this agenda. OK, next slide, please. In our sort of research and study section, I, just, I did want to highlight this one, which you may have come across by another route, but this is a very interesting study, I think, because it's um, they're actually looking for women who um, made a life threatening suicide attempt either in pregnancy or in the year after their baby was born and we know how high risk this area is i think it's um it's really needed that we have more research into this area and um we've got uh, professor louise howard leading on it so if you have any of the women that you're working with that are in that sort of category. It says about the criteria there for participants and the link to the details of the study, but I think this is a really important one to support. OK, next slide, please. I've added a couple of articles of interest here. Um, one is because obviously we are always aware of how hard people are working, how best to support workforce, and there's a really good article here published by the King's Fund on compassion and supporting nurses and midwife wives to deliver high quality care. And then the other one about inclusion health, I think is a really important article and I would suggest people add it into induction packs because it's just a really, really good article to read to start nurses thinking about inclusion health and what that means on the health inequalities agenda. Next slide, please. It's um, it's really great to see sort of campaigning moving into action. And here we have the amazing five times more who have actually on the 13th of September this year, launched the Black Maternal Health All-Party Parliamentary Group with the first meeting taking place in October. So um, we'll really look at, out with, with um, keen interest to see what, what drops out from that group. Next slide, please. And I'm sure you'll all be aware that we are actually in the second Black Maternal Mental Health Week today. So those of you that are on Twitter will be seeing a lot of the things coming through Twitter and other social media about what's going on this week. Um, so leading on quite nicely from that, if I can have the next slide. We are very lucky today to have Naomi Celeste from the Sheffield Maternity Cooperative and Naomi is going to talk to us about 
the work of her cooperative and also to give us an insight and a little taster for her training. And this is one of the trainings that was on Liz's slide and one of the trainings that we have commissioned. So you'll be getting details of that training coming out soon for those of you that are in the southeast. And those of you that are in other parts of the country, I think it'd be really good to to have a listen to Naomi and see if it's training that you might want to commission yourselves. OK, thank you very much, Naomi. I'll hand over to you now. There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Naomi Celeste. Um, I'm a worker member of the SMC. Um, I work part time as I've got a little boy as well, um, as well as um, kind of helping manage um, the projects that we're doing. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, kind of the basis of what the SMC is. Um, and then I'll talk about our community of cultures project, um, as well as the training that was mentioned. So have we got our slides ready? Lovely, thank you very much. Um, all right then, so next slide please. Thank you very much. So what is the SMC? So we're a cooperative um, rather than a charity. And um, we do have a chair, um, she's a midwife called Beanish Nazmeen. Um, and we're a collection of people, midwives and birth workers um, with the shared values of inclusivity and a shared goal of community-led support for reproductive health. Um, we believe that maternity support should be community-led and community-owned and, and those who are most in need are given the support they require. We offer advocacy, consent and knowledge uh, sharing in maternity should be a key element of the antenatal preparation and birth and postnatal support. And we believe that childbearing is a community event and is part of family life. Um, it started in Sheffield. Um, the two workers that kind of created it are from Sheffield and I'm in Sheffield, but we are creating a toolkit at the minute to help people around the country create their own cooperatives if they want to as well. Next slide, please. Um, so we offer regular workshops via Zoom and um, started during lockdown of the pandemic. Um, these sessions are led by specialist guests um, or, or by our midwives in our team. Um, the sessions are offered on a contribute as you can basis. So even if people can't offer or can't afford to contribute anything, they can still come. Um, some of the topics that we've included have been infant feeding, your rights in birth, infant sleep, abortion support, first trimester support, loss support, pain relief and um, in birth and labor, birth plans, nutrition in pregnancy, community groups, hypnobirthing, induction of labor, baby wearing and creative workshops. We offer one-to-one -one advocacy and support with one of our midwives or perinatal specialists. And at the minute it's specific to Sheffield, um, as in we, we're now offering community events or in-person events and dual opportunities as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So people can access our support without being a member, um, but we do offer membership. So you can become a member and buy into our vision and, and passion for community-led support. It's donation-based, there's no set fee. Um, so people have a little bit more money, they can pay a little bit more every year, but you can also not pay anything if you don't have any money to be a member as well. And um, it means you can have your say in how we run the organisation, what we do um, and how we move forward with, with future projects. Um, the regular membership income does help us to keep offering our sessions on a donation and sometimes free basis, just making sure that we offer those support opportunities for everyone. And it's open to everyone in and out of Sheffield. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our Community of Cultures project is quite a new project. Um, it's black and brown um, led um, and it's offering support and free access to specialists for black, Asian and ethnic minority people and families. Um, it's in the early stages at the minute and we're doing lots of work around networking with other organisations on the ground, face to face information sharing and word of mouth. Um, so some of the workshops that we've been offering with specialists are topic based that, have, that are being run by people that say this is what they want to do sessions on in the community. Um, some of the sessions um, have included pregnancy and baby loss, perinatal identity and postnatal depression. Um, we also offer one-to-one -one advocacy and support. We have access to interpreters for all the events if that's needed. And it's a safe space where we can learn from each other and share experiences and there's no hierarchy. 
Uh, it's culture, and we offer the cultural competency workshops there as well. And currently, um, we're kind of developing the queer and trans cultural safety workshop as well, which you kind of all hear about at some point soon. Um, so the workshops were developed by two of our members, Beanish and Hannah, who have both worked in maternity services and done their own research around this issue as well. So what they found was that Black, Asian and minority ethnic and refugee communities or minority communities are often labelled as difficult to engage, when in reality they're easy to ignore. The latest anal anal analysis of maternal mort mort mortality and morbidity highlight the continued inequity and inequality present within our matern maternity and health systems. So we must recognise and accept that it is not race that harms women and babies, but a number of factors, including racial, cultural bias within our systems and workforce. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the workshop's done over two days. They don't have to be consecutive. Um, and it provides participants with the tools to self-reflect and understand their own values and attitudes towards race, migration and diversity. After gaining a deeper understanding of the barriers to healthcare and types of discrimination faced by birthing people and their families from BAMA communities, participants will be empowered with the tools to reflect upon and analyze their own practice. They will then create individual action plans and gain confidence to engage with these communities as conscious practitioners. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, so um, all because the topics we discuss can be hard hitting and emotional and emotionally provoking, it's crucial that we ensure we create a safe space for all that attend and emotional support following the workshops if needed as well. And all group, all group members will be able to express their views openly and anonymously without judgment. They'll reflect upon their own values and attitudes around the race, as well as those of others. They'll be able to distinguish between assumptions, myths and realities around the communities they work with, understand the need for active community engagement and mutual learning, and identify concrete steps toward active engagement according to their professional role. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so these are our co-creators of the workshop. This is Beanish Nazmin. Um, she's a senior midwife, and those are just some of the roles that she's been involved in. You may have even heard of her. Um, she's, she's involved in a lot, um, but you, I'll, I'll let you read what she's involved in or, or research her if you want to at a later date. Next slide, please. And Hannah is our other amazing person. Um, she's also an experienced midwife with lots of background in humanitarian work. Um, she's recently started a new role as a lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University um, and does lots of work for the SMC, um, as well as she's really experienced in teaching sensitive content in difficult contexts as well. Next slide, please. Um, there we are. So those are links to our email addresses, our websites. You can find us on social media sites. And um, we've got an, um, a phone number on our website. So if you ever have any questions or just want to get in touch with us, feel free. Um, a lot of us um, have other full-time jobs as well, as well as little people. So we do kind of work all different kinds of hours between all of us, but somebody will always get back to you when we can. And that's it really, that's us. I'm open to any questions. If not, then that's us really. Thank you very much. That's brilliant, Naomi. Thank you. And uh, training sounds incredible. I, I'm really excited for it. Yes. Uh, and it's so needed. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I've I've got a question. Are, are you teaching um, outside of maternity as well at all? Just I know obviously you've got us, which is perinatal mental health, but mm -hmm. you've gone into sort of health more generally because this is this is all of our business, isn't it? Of right. course, it's everyone's business. I think because um, we've been a small organisation, we haven't started advertising the course. At the minute, it's only coming from word of mouth, which is fantastic. Um, but so at the minute, it's mostly maternity services. And at the minute, we're booked up till nearly, nearly February now. So wow. soon we're going to start looking at where else can we branch out in other services, education, health. Um, so that it is the plan to kind of go as far as we can to as many people as possible. We've just got to start small because we're quite small. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean it, it's just so needed, and and it's just amazing that 
that you guys are, are doing this so fantastic has anybody um got any other questions for naomi there's lots of people saying it's brilliant Thank so you. I have, yeah <laughs> that's nice <laughs> um so from carla in manchester mm -hmm. would you consider a train the trainer model yes so that is actually a model that we're kind of starting now and um, we're just having to look at costings um for kind of resources and things but we are looking at train the trainer literally the last the last few weeks we've had a few meetings about that so that is another plan as well so people can start rolling this out themselves in their own organizations as well so yes that is the plan brilliant that that would yeah we'll really look forward to seeing that one coming because it, it's such a great way of getting the message out there isn't it yeah yeah, yeah definitely okay do we have any other questions We're, oh, if not well thank you naming so much and You're i'm welcome. really looking forward to the training um great. so if we can go on to the next slide then thank you um so it gives me great pleasure to introduce becky gill who's going to talk to us about um provider collaboratives i know that we have sort of mentioned this in in previous webinars but because this is um becoming more and more of a reality and we're getting nearer and nearer to starting all this work we thought it was really important to um get becky to come and speak today and just introduce us to the concept really so as judge judy would say put your listening ears on and uh, i'll hand over to becky Oh, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, nice to meet everybody and thanks very much for having me today. My name is Becky Gill and I'm one of the programme managers in the provider collaborative team, which is part of the mental health policy team in NHS England and improvement. So as Jenny said, here today to give you a little bit of an update, an overview on provider collaboratives and, and what they are and kind of the future of provider collaboratives for perinatal mental health services. And it feels a little bit like provider collaboratives have become a little bit of a buzzword in um, the NHS in kind of recent recent months so hopefully this will be helpful but as Jenny said just kind of a starter introducing you to the concept and where we've got to I guess we're thinking about provider collaboratives for perinatal mental health so can I have the next slide please and the next yeah thank you so this slide just gives a little bit of an overview of kind of the commitment in relation to provider collaboratives that we're working to that's set out in the long term plan and what provider collaboratives are. So <clears throat> provider collaboratives um, came about um, because there was a recognition in some specialised services that um, people were having to access care really far away from where they lived. They were having to go into hospital perhaps when they didn't need to and they couldn't come out of hospital quickly um, because there wasn't support in the community. And it was actually Simon Stevens and a group of mental health chief execs that kind of came up with the idea of because in specialised services, um, it's it's traditionally been commissioned by regional teams and groups of providers or providers don't necessarily have that oversight of where patients in their population are accessing services. Is there a model by which we can delegate some of the commissioning responsibility and the money for populations to a group of providers who can then think about how they spend that money to better meet the needs of their population? So making sure people um, Go into hospital only going to hospital when they when they have to which is the right thing for some people but that there is care in the community um, as another option for where people can have their their needs met so that model was piloted and tested um across a few different service lines in specialized commissioning and um, so adults low and medium secure children and young people's inpatient <laughs> services and adult eating disorder services and it was piloted in 2016-17 and 2017-18 and that model was evaluated and if colleagues haven't seen that I can obviously that model is different to kind of perinatal but for information and if, if of interest I can share that evaluation with colleagues so now we've got a commitment in the long-term plan that this model will be applied to all appropriate 
specialised mental health and learning disability and autism services and mother and baby units are are one of those services um, and the second part of the slide just talks a little bit about kind of how the model works in a bit more detail so as I said groups of providers coming together to take on the responsibility for the commissioning of services for their population and the, the money um, and they are led by a lead provider which has to be an NHS organisation um, NHS England and improvement remain the accountable commissioner and they have a contract with the lead provider and the lead provider can subcontract with other providers in the collaborative so they can work together to kind of pull their resource um, whether that's kind of funding or workforce and think about how they can work together as groups of providers and i um, happy to share a little bit more detail it, it maybe as an annex to this pack when they get sent out but um, the footprints vary, I guess, in different parts of the country. So some of the footprints are like a regional footprint. So East of England have quite a big provider collaborative and others are smaller. So in the north, they've got sort of ones that are coterminous with their ICS. So that's sort of kind of the ins and outs of the model. But if I just go on to the next slide, please. Thinking about the impact that kind of we want provider collaboratives to have on people, families, pathways of care. We've built some kind of key principles into the model for the phase one provider clubs, which are the ones that are going live at the moment, which are about kind of how we really want them to be transformational in the space of delivering improved outcomes and experiences for people and families um, in these specialised services where historically like I said, they've had to maybe access care really far from where they lived or their outcomes of care haven't been particularly great. So thinking about um, how we do that, there are kind of some rules or principles that we've built in the model. So one of them is co-production and involvement. So each provider collaborative has to have uh, lived experience throughout all stages or levels of its provider collaborative, including um, paid roles for people who have lived experience in sort of that commissioning function um, or decision making function of the lead provider um, and we've got some really nice examples of where that's happening at the moment so northeast and um, central london cyp provider collaborative their um, kind of chief executive board is chaired by someone with lived experience and they've got a group of young people who've decided des designed the a quality oversight framework so they go into um, the providers in the collaborative and they assess the quality of those services talking to the staff and talking to the young people um, thinking about how we uh, can tackle health inequalities again um, another big kind of area for these services um, so where we've got over representation of particular groups of people in specialised services um, and how we need to kind of encourage joint working across pathways of care. So we know some of the provider collaboratives, particularly for eating disorders, have um, joined up with their CCG or ICS now to think about how they can, you know, think together about, well, who's coming into our um, specialised services who might not be getting that access in the community and how can we think together about tackling health inequalities? Um, I'll, I'll leave that there because I'm mindful of time but that just explains some of the kind of other areas that we want the provider collaboratives to focus on in terms of the impact of people and families if you go on to the next slide please cool so this um slide is probably just more for information so as I said we've got phase one provider collaboratives that cover those services that are in that top box and we've got 48 of those provider collaboratives and we hope all of them will be live on the 1st of October so they've been going live since the 1st of October last year so it's been quite a long process to get those provider collaboratives live but will be um 100% live hopefully on the 1st of October which is really exciting and a lot of work's gone in um, from provider colleagues and regional colleagues to kind of make this happen and then the services in the bottom box are the ones that are part of phase two which is where the mother and baby units come in 
and they um, they tend to be those much more specialised services um, that have fewer beds. Um, so when we think about a provider collaborative model, we need to be really careful about how we do that because they're very, very different to the services that are in phase one. So if you go on to the next slide, please. So the approach that we've taken to the services that are in phase two, and I'd say perinatal is the one where we've done the most work. Um, we agreed a process by which there was recognition that those services in that, that phase two box are really different to phase one and that we need to take each of those services in turn and work together with clinicians, people with lived experience, commissioners, <clears throat> third sector organisations and think, you know, what are or could be the benefits of a provider collaborative model going back to those sorts of key principles in that circle that I was talking about? And is there is there benefit to a provider collaborative model? Um, so that's what we've done with perinatal. Um, if you go on to the next slide, this slide just sets out a timeline of kind of what we've done, which I'll talk through because um, there's kind of lots of work that's gone on up until this point. And um, so which some of you, I hope, have been involved in because we've done quite a bit of engagement over the last two years. So we started working with the perinatal clinical reference group, which is a national it's a national clinical reference group for perinatal covering community and inpatient services, which is chaired by Giles Beresford, who's the clinical advisor. And we took a question to them, you know, provider collaboratives um, are happening for these other services and there's a potential for it to happen in the perinatal. But what do people think works really well now in perinatal and what what are some of the challenges? What what are the areas of improvement and could a provider collaborative approach help or support or change that? And at that first discussion, I think and throughout there's been absolute recognition of how far we've come in perinatal mental health services um, with the development of the community teams through the five year forward view. And that's really come through from when we've talked to clinicians, commissioners, people with lived experience, but that there still kind of remains this split in the commissioning of the perinatal pathway and that can lead to um, kind of a disconnect from a kind of clinical perspective but also from the experience of people when they're trying to access services that that kind of uh, movement from a community team to an inpatient team or back down the other way can be quite tricky um, and I think that that is reflective of that that split in commissioning that one of them is commissioned by a CCG or there will be an ICS and then one of them is commissioned by the regional team so the CRG sort of set us on our way to kind of think about would there be an opportunity to join up a, the perinatal pathway and when I say perinatal pathway I mean those two parts so the community team and the inpatient um, mother and baby units but acknowledge that for someone accessing a service the pathway is much broader than that and it can include lots of other services. So over that summer we held lots of workshops with people who've got lived experience, clinicians, commissioners and sort of ask similar questions around what works well, what are some of the challenges, could a provider collaborative approach help and those kind of key themes were coming out around that disconnect in the pathway and you know thinking that provider collaboratives could be a real opportunity to try and resolve that in some way. I think other things that came out were around tackling health inequalities and in particular the experience of black mums who um, accessing community services or inpatient services and their experience tends to be poorer than than um, other other people that are accessing those services um, and also kind of co-production. So I think in some areas that's done really well in perinatal and um, which is which is fabulous, but still kind of is there an area, can, is there a way that we can improve that? And I guess that we know, as Liz mentioned at the beginning, trying to mitigate this, that the money for perinatal that's kind of been put forward as part of the long term plan doesn't necessarily always reach frontline services. So would this be a way to change that? And I know that the national team, as Liz said, have kind of been working on some actions to try and ensure that ICSs are going to spend that that money on perinatal services. So we set up a task and finish group in November last year, which Jenny 
um, from the clinical network and, and Vic Trimble from Specialised Commissioning from the South East really kindly um, were part of. And that task and finish group really sort of started from the beginning. So we we kind of took a look at everybody's feedback, but then as a group said, right, well, what, what do we want provider collaboratives to achieve? What do we want them to do for perinatal? And we sort of developed some key principles. So one of them being that we absolutely want to join up the whole pathway. We think that any footprint should have a mother and baby unit in it um, and that the building blocks for these provider collaboratives should be ICS footprints. And um, we then kind of um, looked at a whole range of options. So do we do nothing? Do we have a kind of national provider collaborative just for mother and baby units? And we we talked those through as a task and finish group and did a bit of an options appraisal alongside the task and finish group. Um, which had experts by experience on it. We also had a um, expert reference group that just had people who've got lived experience and it was chaired by someone who's got lived experience and they provided a bit of check and challenge to the task and finish group. So the task and finish group would share their outputs and the expert reference group would kind of review it and give their feedback, which was really, really great. Um, and the kind of the recommendation that the task and finish group have put forward is that we do want to do provider collaboratives for perinatal men's health services and the aim should be about aligning that commissioning between community perinatal men's health teams and mother and baby units how that happens i think is is something that we need to kind of think about when we go on to the next stage um nationally but with colleagues in the regions and the clinical networks and and you yourselves on the call as well because I think that that will depend on kind of local arrangements pathways and footprints and it might be that some areas want to go further with this model I know in Greater Manchester they've got a sort of provider collaborative already but around parent infant relationships so they bring other services into the, their collaborative not just the community perinatal team and the, and the mother and baby unit so we've been taking that um, recommendation through our governance process, um, which has been quite lengthy and colleagues might have seen um, papers that have been have been shared as part of that, but it was signed off finally um, on Monday by our oversight group. And this, I should say, this has been quite a, it's been a really joint piece of work between the provider collaborative team, specialised commissioning, so Giles and Sarah Warmington, um, who lead on the mother and baby unit piece and the policy team. So colleagues might know Lucy Ellis and Sarah Dunstan, who kind of manage that CCG kind of pot of money and those community services. So together trying to lead this from a national perspective, because that's essentially what we're going to be asking the system to do is to work across the path, the pathway. Um, if we just go on to the next slide. So this was an A4, but I've had to cut it in half so it could fit on the slide. These are some of the, well, these are the principles that were co-produced by the task and finish group. So one of the members, um, uh, Sandra, who runs the motherhood group, colleagues might know where she uh, pulled together these key principles that were co-produced by the, by the um, expert reference group, sorry, which I think are fabulous. Um, so going forward, we will be building kind of the, the, the model and the implementation plan and when we kind of um, want to see, uh, I don't want to call it like an approval process, but we will want to see kind of how provider collaboratives are going to meet these key principles, which I think um, came through really strongly from all our conversations and the, and the expert reference group kind of pulled them together and confirmed them. Um, so the next step is that we understand that some areas have been having conversations about this because colleagues have been on the task and finish group and have known it's coming um, and other areas might not and that's absolutely fine we want to do a bit of an exercise by where we where we go out through regional colleagues and i mean non-specom regional colleagues, so jenny and liz um, and specialized commissioning colleagues which would be kind of big big side and clinical networks and kind of get a bit of a sense in each region of where these discussions are up to. Um, so do you have any idea of kind of what footprints you might be looking at? Where have discussions got to about thinking about the whole pathway? What support would be helpful from the national team? And, and when do you think you might want to implement this? Because um, we were thinking 
from April, but it might be that that, that, that was never going to be everywhere. But we just want to get a sense of kind of readiness and where people are at in terms of implementation to help us inform kind of the next steps. And we'll be setting up a bit of a working group to help um, design that kind of implementation process, if you like, um, which colleagues from the task and finish group will be part of. I'll just flag that alongside this, we are we have commissioned the motherhood group to do kind of an extra piece of work, building on these key principles, but looking at how can this model really um, really enable kind of tackling health inequalities for peri in perinatal mental health services. So what kind of extra key principles or like rules, if you like, do we want to build in the model that will enable that to happen? Because we recognise that's kind of it's so important in these services and want to use the provider collaborative as an opportunity to to move that agenda forwards um i think that's it i appreciate that's a lot of information but i'm happy to take any questions or discussion and sorry if i overran jenny no <laughs> quite unusual for us we're on we're doing for the time so we do have time for lots of questions um and what i would say to you is don't be frightened to ask because this is a new concept yeah and when i first heard about it it took me ages as becky will tell you it took me absolutely ages to get it so don't feel like you can't ask a question because it you know it's too silly or too basic this is absolutely the time to ask any questions that you that you have um, you know, there's only 50 other people on the call, so <laughs> be brave and ask away because otherwise we don't learn, do we, if we don't ask? No, and you're right, Jenny, it's such a, I, I know kind of, we've had some questions, we've been working with CYP colleagues and it isn't, it isn't as much of a new area to them because they've done it in phase one, but I appreciate if perinatal is brand new, so yeah, please ask questions. I think Carla. So we've, we've got a question from Carla. Yeah, um, it's always me, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I suppose I'm wondering about thinking about sort of the northwest where we've got two mother and baby units and one of those mother and baby units has got an outreach service and the other one hasn't. How? So I, I suppose my my thing is what what will happen there? How will that balance itself out? Because it feels like you'd have to up the one with the with, that hasn't got outreach to make it mm. equitable, equitable. Mm. I do you want me to say a bit? You can go for, yeah, and then I can come in. And then yeah. So what I would say, Carla, and I think this is something that probably most people on the call will recognise, is that so our mother and baby beds are open to all women because obviously if they can't access their local one because it's full, they have to be able to access another one because um, otherwise they'll be separated from the baby, which is what, you know, none of us want that to happen. So we had, we've kept that as a sort of red line within the um, steering group for the yeah. provider collaboratives. So that, that, so just park that. But alongside that, I think there's going to be a massive role for outreach um, within the provider collaborative model, because I think what we have now, and that this is the bit I'm saying, I think people will recognize, is that all women are equal, but some are more equal than others. And what I mean by that is in terms of MBU admissions, you get a bigger slice of the cake if you're linked to the mother and baby unit at the moment. So there are providers that don't have a, an MBU and rely on other MBUs for admissions, but really can sometimes feel a bit marginalised from that process. So I would say robust outreach, meaningful outreach that works not just in that locality, but across your footprint, whatever that looks like when it's decided, is going to be key to this to ensure that the right women get admitted so either yeah so i think outreach is is massive in this color and it may be that we all need to be leveling up to that um but i'll i'll defer to becky to answer no. from her point of view as well 
Yeah, no, and it's such a good point, Jenny, and I didn't mention that in the presentation about that rule around provider collaboratives absolutely cannot um, stop women accessing beds based on patient choice or clinical need, like that that still, need, that still needs to happen and that that narrative is very different to phase one of the provider collaboratives, which has been much more around people still access beds based on need, but um, kind of shifting resource from inpatient into community. And I think that for perinatal, it's very different and we need to be very clear about that because not all the provider collaboratives approaches are the same, but I think sometimes when people hear it, it kind of for perinatal that's not what we want to happen because we're trying to still build the the number of beds aren't we and as part of that kind of going out and asking where everyone's up to part of the information that we want to collect is so within your footprint who has an outreach function in their MBU and who doesn't so we get a sense of that but I think Jenny's absolutely right that it's kind of really fundamental to the model isn't it that outreach function in the it's mm. crucial, going to be crucial in joining up the pathway. Yeah. Any Thank other you. questions? Good, good. I, does, was that helpful, Carla? You got any sort of supplementary questions? No, no, that was great. Thank you. Like I say, it just sort of, you, you, you hear it. I mean, the whole presentation has been really helpful for me. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Good, good. And again, I'd say to people on the call, don't think it's a silly question, just to ask it, because that's how I learned. I had to really start from scratch with this to get my head around it and ask the most basic questions when I first started. So this is a this is one of the opportunities you'll get to to do that. So stick them in the chat or or ask away. And I would say that Jenny did ask a lot of questions, but I learned a lot from Jenny because I befriended Jenny and thought I'm going to need to make friends with Jenny so she can give me her information as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I think this is a big shift. I think it it will look different, but I do. I can really see the benefits of it. Oh, Carla. Sorry, I have got one more. No, that's great. Um, it's me, isn't it, normally? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of, um, so as you've already alluded to, Grace Manchester, we've already got a sort of collaborative going with Parenting for Mental Health. Yeah. So I suppose I was just thinking about um, what happens when you can't agree <laughs> in that collaborative? What What's the process then? Do you mean to, you can't agree your footprint, Carla, or you can't agree, like, how to spend the money, I suppose, I'm, I'm thinking about really. Yeah, OK. So, um, Jenny, shall I, shall I start? Then? Yeah, please. Yeah, so um, I think we're in a little bit of a different position to perinatal in that when we did phase one, we reflecting on this this morning with colleagues in the South East, we hadn't, areas were bidding to be lead providers and be provider collaboratives, but we hadn't done any of the kind of policy guidance, whereas now we have a lot of that already. And um, so we've got kind of templates, Carla, and things that people can use that can help that process. So as part of, to become a provider collaborative, um, there has to be a governance structure that's set up. Um, which should enable that kind of decision making and where the money is spent and um, and things like partnership agreements that kind of all the providers um, sign up to together about how they're going to work and um, how they're going to vote if you like around how that money's that money spent and reinvested so we've got some of those tools already but it's not in some areas I think that has been really difficult and challenging because what we're asking to providers to do is work in a really different way so traditionally providers that have had been in competition with each other were saying okay now go and collaborate and work together and yeah. you know change yeah. the world but I think um in some areas that has taken longer but I think that kind of that those discussions happening organically and using those tools to help has been has been really helpful but it hasn't been easy in in, in some areas but I think that it's kind of kind of in the long term and strategically we we know that that it's probably a better better model and way of working yeah I, I suppose I, actually I'm actually quite looking forward to it because I think perinatal has always worked quite well together yeah. across yeah. boundaries but I think um it'd be nice to work closer 
with, with other colleagues and learn from them. I think, you know, we don't get we, we get lots of opportunities, but I still don't think there's enough opportunity to learn from each other. Yeah. And I think like we've heard in perinatal that like the role of the voluntary sector, third sector is is huge. So how like how can we work more closely with them and bring them into the provider collaborative in some way, which they are doing in in the phase one services. But I think for perinatal, we've heard that they can play a really um, they play a really important role in things like peer support. So, yeah, bringing them in as well. Great. Thank you. That's it from me now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lucy, Lucy, is that public health, Lucy? It is. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Hi, hi Becky. That, that was hi. great. Can I please just check my understanding? Maybe a really random question. Where would your public health nursing sit within this collaborative as a universal service? Would it would it sit amongst it or or not? Or or does that just depend? So, um, Lucy, where do you sit now and and how are you kind of commissioned? So we're, we're local authority. OK, yeah. So um, and are you are you just for perinatal or are you more broad than that? No, so so um, it, it's just a, a kind of, um, you know, very kind of open question, just as I'm yeah. trying to just kind of grasp and, and get my head around it. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we commissioned the 0 to 19 Public Health Nursing Service yeah. in, in Hampshire. So I'm just kind of wondering kind of potentially how that would, you know, potentially sit within a model like this. Yeah. And whether uh, that kind of universal local authority commission service yeah. would uh, kind of continue and obviously work very closely with, with any... Um, yeah. Um, collaborative or or whether in any other areas there yeah. has been whether it's been kind of brought within a collaborative yeah so <clears throat> I think it probably depends Lucy but in some areas in the phase one provider collaboratives they um do you have money pulled with the local authority and um, so there's absolute there's potential to do that um, and if the, if there isn't kind of that formal pooling local authority colleagues in I'm just talking about phase one here but we want we will want to think about how this applies to perinatal are part of the governance so they're on the program board they're involved in kind of those decisions around reinvestment because I think for I say adult secure for people who've got a learning disability or autism the local authority you know links with them is really significant about where that money is spent so I think really happy to have another discussion with you Lucy but absolutely potential for for that kind of resource to be included in some way in the collaborative whether that's kind of formal or as a partner mm -hmm. okay that's great but thank you but, but very very early kind of thoughts and considerations but really useful just to kind of set the scene really no thank you yeah. and it you know that you're such important stakeholders for this yeah. pathway we absolutely want you involved um and our colleagues in maternity as well obviously yeah. um okay so could i ask that any other questions get put in the chat are you happy to answer them in the chat becky are you staying for a yeah I'll stay and also I'll pop my email address in the chat because people might yeah. feel com more comfortable emailing them. I'm really yeah. happy to do that <laughs> no that that's that's fantastic so thank you so much I hope that's sort of um started that thought process around this this um concept of provider collaboratives and we will be um revisiting this with the stakeholder event and various other meetings coming up so that we can all start to work together on it. OK, thank you, Becky. Lovely. So let's move on to another Becky. And this time we have in our Hello, My Name is slot. I'm really delighted to introduce Becky Inglis, who is a pharmacist, a perinatal pharmacist, um, has also agreed to be part of the Living Library, as I mentioned earlier. And um, I'm really interested to hear about more about her role. Well, obviously, I know some about her role, but I don't know all of it. But also, I think this is really, really important for people that are in business plan world at the moment to have a think about this role and what it can bring to the perinatal pathway. So thank you so much, Becky, and I'll hand over to you now. Hi, thank you for having me. 
Um, so hopefully some of you will be familiar with working with pharmacists. I know some teams have already got them within their MDT, others haven't worked with pharmacists at all. So hopefully I'll be able to give you an insight into what we can do. Can I have the next slide, please. And the next one, thanks. So a report published in 2017 focused on the future of mental health workforces and it identified pharmacy as an untapped resource with much to offer and um, particularly with pharmacists experts in medicines and the training that we have we can really support um, mental health services with um, kind of helping people with their medication and in the perinatal period this is particularly helpful for pregnancy and breastfeeding queries and helping people to understand the pros and cons of treatments next slide please thank you um, so this is a really novel role. It was novel not just for perinatal but also within pharmacy because usually pharmacists are part of a pharmacy department and they're usually contracted out. Um, however, I'm completely separate from our pharmacy department. I'm completely integrated within our perinatal team. So the Berkshire perinatal team is set up quite differently. I'm completely dedicated to them. I work part time. And it was initially a pilot role that was sort of commissioned for 18, 20, 20 months um, and was sort of two and a half days a week. The outline was we want a perinatal lithium management guideline. You can do some training and medicines information, but we don't really know what else you can do. Um, so it was kind of setting up a completely new role with nothing to work from and just kind of trying to figure out how I could best be involved. Um, so I offer specialist advice and support to professionals within the trust, within acute trust, primary care um, and also to patients. I offer bespoke training to all professionals that are kind of involved in the perinatal period. Um, and that's not just medication that I do a lot of the general trust perinatal training um, and kind of build medication into that, just kind of giving prescribers and also professionals working with patients more confidence um, sort of to have discussion about medication and to not rush into decisions and to really think about the pros and cons and then guideline development sort of the lithium management guideline which we now use and is being used in other areas as well across the country um, any sort of medicines management um, procedures so kind of transportation and storage of medicines if the team need to handle those um, but also being involved in the acute trust guidelines. So the Royal Berkshire Hospital asked me to be involved in their mental health and wellbeing guidelines. So kind of touching base with our acute services as well. And in terms of um, promotion of physical health monitoring, I sort of lead on physical health and it, it's it generally well covered by our primary care colleagues. But the, at the moment within Berkshire, we don't have a particularly robust system for making sure that women are being monitored appropriately. So that's a project that I'm sort of looking at working on in the next year or two. And there's a lot of work going on across pharmacy to kind of really make sure that physical and mental health are being looked at together and not in isolation. Um, so that's something that we can certainly support with. Um, specialist medicines information service. So most trusts should have a, a medicines information service or access to one. And usually that would involve kind of um, pharmacists or technicians gathering data, summarising it and presenting it to the inquirer. And our MI team usually, um, before I started, had about 75 to 80 pregnancy breastfeeding queries um, in a year. And that's now dropped to 15 or 20. And I've kind of taken about three quarters of the queries. They maintain some for competence and kind of they involve me in discussions, but it's quite a different level of service. So rather than just gathering data, I'll kind of um, contact prescribers or the inquirers, ask for more information, do a bit of research from some primary care databases, find out what the situation is with this particular patient. And it's very patient focused. And then rather than providing data, I'll kind of summarize and provide maybe one, two, or possibly three treatment options that might be appropriate. And then all the resources, whether that's information leaflets or websites, for those prescribers to be able to go away and have good conversations with patients about their treatment and feel prepared and supported to be able to have real quality um, conversations. And um, in terms of sort of quality improvement, unfortunately, the access to information leaflets about medication are relatively limited. Some of you might be familiar with the Choice and Medication website, Breastfeeding Network, Bumps. 
But actually, the information isn't entirely comprehensive, um, not always relevant, um, and sometimes doesn't feel quite appropriate. So I've ended up writing a lot of information leaflets about the most commonly prescribed medications. And from those, kind of developing templates for writing letters to GPs and prescribers um, and sort of helping to upskill staff within the team and almost using these leaflets as scripts to kind of talk through information with women. And then if they aren't able to answer any questions, they can refer back to me and I can support with that. So it's kind of standardising and improving the quality of information that, that prescribers, professionals and patients are receiving. Um, and then kind of doing more, lots of training and education, um, strategic work as well, working really closely with service manager, um, working as a, a member of the leadership team, work, supporting with accreditation, um, kind of developing business cases with the service lead. So it's kind of really, it, it's a quite expansive role and has really developed over the sort of four and a half years that I've been in post. And in terms of supervision and mentoring, I'm line management for allied health professionals within the team, although psychology is slightly separate. So I'm um, overseeing a, an occupational therapist to do supervision with them. I supervise um, and offer mentoring for three other perinatal pharmacists across the country um, and also sort of peer supervision with our um, trust early intervention psychosis pharmacist because her role is very, very similar, just a slightly different cohort of patients. So making sure that that support is there. So there's a lot of supervision and training. Next slide, please. So in the last four and a half years, 394 clients have received input from me. Um, and most of those patients, that will be a single contact and the majority are over the phone. So I know um, having started off as the only pharmacist within perinatal, there's now nearly 30, if not around 30 of us across the country. Um, and they've sort of sprung up in the last couple of years. And some of them have specific clinics where with allotted time slots, but I tend to work in a much more flexible way so that I can really um, sort of respond to any urgent requests for medication support um, and maybe assessment, treatment assessment. And that means that I can really react and be very quick to respond to um, requests where the consultants perhaps have a more fixed schedule and they might have some more urgent slots that they can put people into, it, their flexibility is, is relatively limited compared to me. So sometimes I'll get um, sort of requests from the consultants to um, have a quick discussion about someone, go and review that patient, get them started on things, review them until that consultant is able to take over or we work together to kind of manage that patient. So it's a really flexible way of working. Um, it does mean that I tend to kind of have a list of patients, I'll prioritise them and then I'll work my way through. So my, my DNAs are very low because if someone doesn't respond or answer, I'll just move on to the next person and come back. And nine times out of 10, patients are absolutely happy to speak to me when I call. And if they're not able to speak to me, we, we arrange a specific time that's convenient for them. Um, and I offer kind of video calls and I'll say to them, do you want me to just quickly send you a link? We can sort of click on that and have a face to face. But to be honest, most of them just want to speak to me whilst they're on the phone. They're like, actually, no, I'd rather just talk to you whilst you're there. And it doesn't really seem to be a barrier being on the phone. Um, I, I ha will go out to patients' homes if needed, if they're going to struggle to engage either over the phone or online. So I'm really flexible. Um, most conversations last around 45 to 60 minutes, so they're quite lengthy and they're very comprehensive. But if someone has very complex needs or very complex medication or a lot of questions, it, I can absolutely be on the phone with them for an hour and a half to two hours if needed to really make sure that they get the information that they that they need to make that decision. So it's supporting informed treatment decisions and making sure that women feel comfortable with the options that they have and that they are able to make the right decision for them. Um, conversations usually involve kind of understanding their ideas, expectations and concerns about treatment, about their mental health condition, understanding their current um, kind of pregnancy, previous pregnancies, any postnatal periods, their current and previous mental health, any risk in terms of sort of thoughts of self-harm and suicide. Um, 
And also maybe whether they become disinhibited or vulnerable when they relapse, if it's sort of a psychotic illness. So it's really understanding that patient and their circumstances and then understanding what medicines have been tried, what options are available to them, what's been effective, what side effects have they experienced, and then understanding the potential risks around suboptimal treatment or not receiving treatment, whether that's medication or psychological input, um, but also the risks that exposing their baby to medication might present and helping them to weigh up the pros and cons. Um, and that can take a little bit of time. And it, it, women are usually very, very worried about exposing their babies. So it's helping them to understand what, what are the risks? What have they been told? What have they read? What is their understanding? Um, maybe some psychoeducation about sort of maybe the limitations of medication for patients who have um, perhaps unstable personality disorder. So it's really um, sort of a, a holistic approach. Um, and then every patient is sent a copy of their GP letter. GP receives a letter explaining the conversation and all those pros and cons. And some people are absolutely ready to make a decision about their treatment at the end of that conversation. Um, and I will be asking the GP to prescribe on my behalf. We, we don't have a prescribing budget. So even though I'm a prescriber, it's more of a direction um, in a letter. <clears throat> um, and then uh, some patients will actually want to kind of go away and have a look through the information, look at the resources that I send them and then contact the GP once they've made a decision. So it, it's a really thorough process. And if I get the next slide, please. And the sorts of input I have is sort of preconceptual counselling, um, not just for sort of high risk women and those on high risk medications like lithium or um, clozapine, for example, but also um, I ask our GT team to send me anyone who would potentially fall under our care should they fall pregnant. So we can kind of have everything set up and in place and make sure that things are ready um, should they fall pregnant and come to us. And then any pregnancy breastfeeding related queries, I do all the primary care queries. None of that goes to the consultant. I do all of them for the whole of Berkshire. Um, and then uh, any sort of, I also do with the caseload ones as well, but if someone is on our caseload and they have more of a general query, they're not pregnant, they're not breastfeeding, maybe they're postnatal, um, then I'm more than happy to do those queries and also any medication reviews for sort of side effects or whether something is sort of efficacious and maybe sort of discussion around diagnosis as well if needed and some other bits pop up too during these conversations quite often physical health. Next slide please. So I used to send out um, survey monkeys and I sent out um, a survey to 128 women and 58 responded. So this is the results from those 58 patients. Um, and this is the knowledge that people were saying they had before they spoke to me. So around 20% knew absolutely nothing about the medication that we were discussing. Just over half sort of knew names and doses. Very few knew how their medicines were working. Um, and sort of around 20%, the risks around taking medication during the perinatal period, and to a lesser extent, the risks around not taking medication. And then following the conversation, next slide, please. I did my job. No one knew nothing, so that's a big tick. Um, interestingly, the names and doses didn't really seem to increase, which kind of suggests that maybe that's not the priority for people. And really understanding how their medicines work and the risks around taking and not taking treatment seemed to be their priority. And people really took on board the information they were presented with. And I discuss how medicines work at a receptor level because that helps people to understand why they might experience side effects. Um, why there might be a delay in the response to treatment, what to expect from treatment, but also if they stop treatment suddenly or, or even gradually sometimes and potentially the effects on their babies. So it's something that is explained in, in um, quite sort of specific, uh, in a specific way, but in a really understandable way. And people really seem to appreciate that. Next slide, please. And of those 48 women who, 58 women who responded, everybody would recommend the service to family and friends and people um, have had really lovely feedback. And this is what was used to kind of extend my um, pilot fixed term contract from two and a half days to a substantive contract and then making it three and a half days a week. 
So I've been three and a half days for a couple of years now um, and I still can't keep up with the workload. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Thank you. So setting up a novel service can be a bit tricky um, and I'm more than happy to kind of share anything that I've got. I talk to sort of service leads and chief pharmacists quite a lot about talking up, uh, talking and setting up services. Um, but using the PQN standards uh, as a general guide for kind of identifying where there might be gaps in the service that you're providing and really understanding the provision of the current service and um, what roles might overlap and how we can really use our skills and training to um, support the team, support the professionals involved in these patients' care and also the, the patients themselves. And then peer support and networking, I've ended up, now there are 20, 30 of us, um, myself and a colleague have set up um, a perinatal network, pharmacist network, um, and we're just building a platform on the NHS Future, future platform um, so make sure that we're able to share resources and really um, collaborate. Um, and myself and another colleague are also organising quarterly CPD um, shared learning events, for pharmacists working in perinatal. So there is a really supportive network of people out there now. Um, I was so lonely for a couple of years, but it's lovely to have more on board. Um, in terms of sort of managing the workload, it is tricky. Um, I'm one pharmacist point seven, trying to cover a, a whole county um, and it's quite full on. And I think with the increase in access rates, it's only going to get um, more busy. So I think the, the new um, college report, the, the CR232 suggests sort of point five of a pharmacist for a um, 10,000 births. Um, that's how I started four and a half years ago and I was interviewed by Health Education England so two, three years ago and I said that's a good starting place but kind of really needing to have two days a week minimum with a service regardless of your um, birth rate I would sort of recommend. It, it's, it's a service that's really needed and I think the consultants really appreciate having that support. Um, getting feedback is tricky. Unfortunately, SurveyMonkey have changed their um, policy and I can only access 40 out of my 70, 80 re um, feedback results that I've got unless I pay. So we're now trying to use Microsoft Forms um, to get feedback, but because it's not embedded in emails when patients click on their emails, the response has been minimal. So feedback is definitely something that we need to keep going, but it's tricky. And I use all sorts of ways to get to GPs. So my letters are training opportunities. I um, provide training to the um, ST3 GPs that are about to qualify. I do the psychiatry study days, their protected learning times. Um, I will get to them any way I can. And I've also been working with a national program um, college, uh, the Centre for Postgraduate Pharmacy Education. So as well as trickling information down to GPs, I'm also training nationally um, sort of primary care pharmacy staff so that they can support prescribers in primary care and sort of sharing my perinatal experience and trying to get as many professionals to be compassionate and understanding of these situations and not necessarily sort of worry and scare patients by sort of suggesting that it might not be safe for them to be taking medication. So it's trying to tackle them from all areas. Next slide, please. It's a really rewarding role. I love it. Um, and it's probably the longest I've been in role and it's been the most, the most rewarding. The feedback has been amazing from clients and professionals, the team and external. So it's definitely, um, and the other pharmacists I work with are, are doing um, really good work and also getting really positive feedback. Next slide, please. So just in case you're thinking about putting a business case together, I thought it might be helpful to provide you with some more information. So really thinking about what you want from a pharmacist and how much time you're going to need. Like I suggested, sort of even if your birth rate is below 10,000, from experience working with the other pharmacists, one day is not enough. It's really hard to do anything constructive in that time. So a minimum of two days, if you can get a whole time equivalent, you'll be laughing. It, it really would benefit the whole team and everyone would be um, kind of really getting the most out of that pharmacist. Um, but as a minimum, I'd say 0.5, you'll get some really good work out of them. Um, usually, um, pharmacy kind of contract out but 
this is sort of a, a novel way of doing it is the perinatal team kind of really um, employing the pharmacist directly and having complete control over what happens um, and supporting evidence. Lord Carter's review talks about the, the lack of parity between inpatient and outpatient services and how pharmacists should be involved in outpatient services. Health Education England interviewed me a few years ago and said that this role is a blueprint for advanced practitioners um, and so that would really support going forwards and the new CR232 also supports pharmacist input. And the next slide please. And then once you've got a pharmacist in your team, just think about how you can utilise their skills. I've heard sort of rumours about um, as a way of increasing access rates, pharmacists doing initial assessments, but we're eight A's and you can have band fives doing that. So it's really thinking about how you effectively utilise that resource. Um, as part of our assessments, they are thorough enough. And if you include those critical questions that you need to have as part of an assessment, um, it can count towards your access rates as long as it's done face to face. So we can contribute to those access rates and we if they're, most of them are relatively sort of single contacts, um, it can really increase your numbers. Um, but it's just making sure that it, it's being used um, as it should be appropriately. And then thinking about the maximum impact, particularly I, I cover a whole um, a, a whole county. So uh, doing sort of virtual and telephone contacts has really helped me. Um, but just think about how you're going to have the maximum impact. And then understanding systems and shadowing each member of the team really helps us to embed and understand how things are working so that we can develop the service around the team and the patients and what they need and really evolve it as it goes along. And then thinking outside the box, the training um, aspect, we're very good at training as a, as a profession um, and we can sort of work alongside sort of other professionals really well and liaise so training provision and strategic work we're really good at um, and whether that's something that you would want your pharmacist to be involved in and then just thinking about clinical supervision and peer support so I have clinical supervision with um, the, my peer in EIP but also with the team consultant so it's just having a little think about that particularly if the pharmacist is not part of the pharmacy department and making sure that they maintain those links and then the peer support is now in place so we can add people to the network and support them. Thank you very much. I think that's it. There's one more slide with my contact details on and I'm more than happy to um, take questions or if you want to contact me at a later date, that's fine. Oh, Becky, that's amazing. Um, I think we all need a Becky, that's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> You've also taken us beautifully right up to time so um oh i see mindy's got a question no that hand's gone again i was just going to say because you very kindly offered to be part of our living library um so that people can get away on time if we ask for questions either to go to you directly or to stick them in the chat and yes. then um we'll get to finish on time so thank you so much becky that was amazing um and um, I'm going to hand back to Liz now so that um, we can um, finish on time. OK, lovely. Thank you, Becky and Jenny. Um, so just to say thank you all. Thank you all to our fantastic speakers today, as always. Um, reminder that the next webinar is on Wednesday, the 20th of October. Um, there will be um, we will be picking up provider collaboratives again a little bit and, and kind of the commissioning at the next webinar, but it will also be a bit of a pick and mix. And then the dates for the rest of the year we will be sending out the 2022 web webinar dates shortly, but they will still be on a Wednesday um, once a month. And then um, final slide, please. Just to remind you. Um, if you've been forwarded the details um, of the invitation today and you want to come on our distribution list, that's the email address um, to send us your contact details and the recording will be available on the website um, in the next week. So um, without further ado, have a great rest of day and uh, we will see you all soon. Take care. Thank you.